Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that may not be suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. I'd like to emphasize that this episode is especially graphic and grisly, so listeners please take heed, and this episode is definitely not for children. When we last left the tale of Zack and Addie, Hurricane Katrina was looming, and the young couple were deeply in love. With Katrina about to hit land, Mayor Ray Nagin urged the citizens of New Orleans to leave, but didn't call for a mandatory evacuation. Lana, left with the children, called Zack in a panic, asking what they were going to do, and he told her nothing, that he was staying with Addie. Lana was furious, but worried enough that she even told Zack he could bring Addie with him, and he still refused. She wasn't jealous at all. She'd known about the relationship for a while. She had found a poem entitled Soldier Boy and Zack's Things, and was happy that he seemed to be moving on to a woman that wanted to care for him. The poem was very loving and tender, and indicated a desire to fix this broken man. And Lana still cared for Zack, even though their relationship was over, so she really was happy and not jealous. But Zack's uncaring attitude towards her and the kids and the onslaught of Katrina was not only infuriating, but out of character for Zack, who adored his children. By the next morning, Katrina was upgraded to Category 4, and then quickly to 5, and looked to be the worst in the city's history. By 10 o'clock that morning, Mayor Nagin did order a mandatory evacuation, but it was too late. Thousands of cars crammed the interstates trying to flee, but so many without the means to travel or anywhere to go were left stranded. While Lana frantically stalked her apartment to hunker down with Jackson and Lily, Zack and Addie supplied her apartment on Governor Nichols Street with liquor and ice from Hogg's Bar. At around 6 a.m. on Monday, August 29th, Katrina made landfall with 145 mile per hour winds that would eventually reach 175 miles per hour. And then the levees broke and the flooding began. Neighborhoods on higher ground, like the French Quarter, were not flooded, but due to power outages, People in those neighborhoods had no idea what was going on around them until Tuesday morning when they started seeing people and whole families walking with all of their belongings to escape the flooding, especially from the poor and predominantly African-American Ninth Ward. To tell of every governmental failure, both locally and nationally, during Katrina would make an entire new podcast all its own. I recommend watching Spike Lee's Requiem when the levees broke, and I also cannot recommend enough Sherry Fink's incredible book, Five Days at Memorial, based on her Pulitzer Prize-winning series of articles for the New York Times that details the five days without power and supplies in one New Orleans hospital. I live in the land of tornadoes and am always on high alert when natural disasters are in the news, but this was different. I remember Katrina vividly and watched with horror what happened to those left stranded and those that did try to evacuate. It's among the most shameful moments in modern American history in my mind. Over 200,000 homes, 81,000 businesses, 176 schools, and six major hospitals were destroyed. The final death toll was 1,836 but over 700 people were reported missing and never found. It caused $81 billion in damage, but the economic impact to Louisiana and Mississippi is estimated to be over $150 billion. When all was said and done, Katrina affected over 90,000 square miles and over 15 million people. 
With over 80% of New Orleans underwater, the French Quarter somehow remained unscathed, and Zach and Addie refused to leave. If they didn't evacuate when the storm hit or the levees broke, they sure as hell weren't leaving now. They were completely swept up in the survivalist life. During the day, they would clear the street of debris and collect supplies, and at night they served drinks and meals of canned beans over campfires to their fellow holdouts. The strange calm and emptiness in New Orleans after Katrina had an exhilarating effect on the couple. It seemed to create a world all their own, and they were deeply in love. They also bonded with other survivalists that refused to leave, and soon met a man named Jack Jones. He was a retired oil rig worker and a New Orleans resident since 1977, and the couple quickly became a part of his life. He had a great setup in a luxury condo on Charter Street with high ceilings and hardwood floors. Jack Jones had been well prepared for Katrina. Keeping a close eye on all hurricane forecasts, he had amassed hundreds of gallons of drinking water. He had a satellite phone, cases of canned food, a huge grill, and an even bigger heart, full of generosity for survivors like Zach and Addie. Food and water were almost non-existent to the tens of thousands stranded at the Superdome and the Memorial Convention Center, both only just blocks from the French Quarter. So you can imagine what it was like for those that had never evacuated, with looters roaming the streets, cops only coming by to ask for weapons because they were being overrun, and general overall pandemonium. The few dozen who remained in the quarter of the over 4,000 normal residents banded together, and the press started referring to them as tribes. And of course, Addie had always loved her tribe, and Zack was rediscovering the brotherhood he had been missing since the army. The couple seemed to thrive in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, reassuring family members that as bartenders they were well stocked, and they even became sort of local celebrities giving interviews to the Mobile Register, the Times, Picayune, and in one particular New York Times piece titled Why Leave Now, detailed their DIY survivalist lifestyle and Addie's fun way of making sure the cops patrolled their neighborhood, which was to regularly flash her breasts to passing cars, ensuring a steady flow of traffic. But their safe little bubble soon burst when they were out, quote, acquiring supplies at Robert's Grocery, a market they had often frequented before and after the storm. Addie was inside alone while Zach waited outside, and she was attacked and nearly raped. She was able to fight the man off, but the post-Katrina bliss was shattered. And not only did her past start creeping back, but the real-life horror of the storm started to affect her as well. Jack Jones recalled a particularly harrowing incident when he was cooking several pounds of hamburger meat on the massive grill. As he began, the flies started swarming. But these weren't just regular flies. Post-Katrina flies congregated in masses and could blacken an entire sidewalk in seconds when they landed together. Addie was sickened and broke down completely. And she wasn't the only one having a delayed reaction. One night, as Zach, Addie, and other friends were watching from a balcony, the 82nd Airborne, many who had just fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, arrived in town and were marching the streets, performing search and rescue. This moment not only reminded Zach of what he considered his own personal failure in the Army, but seeing a platoon marching like that in what was becoming a combat environment was an emotional trigger for PTSD. New Orleans had suddenly become a police state after the days of the calm right after the storm. The NOPD, the National Guard, the Army, and even police forces as far away as Oregon had arrived to restore order and force evacuation on the remaining holdouts. A full evacuation never happened and never could have happened, as the city had no plan for the almost 100,000 residents without the means to leave. And by September 19th, the evacuees began returning, much to the dismay of Katrina holdouts like Zach and Addie. 
They were contemptuous of the returning evacuees. Regardless of the unfairness of the situation, they were the survivors. They didn't run. Zack and Addie were probably more incensed because the return of the evacuees meant an end to their post-Katrina bubble of bliss. By the end of October, things were returning to some kind of normalcy. But racial tensions were high, blame was still running rampant, and the murder rate was ever-increasing. Zack and Addie returned to their former bartending jobs, and Lana began demanding that Zack step back up and take some responsibility for his children. Lana had suffered greatly during and after Katrina, with a stay in an emergency shelter and then evacuation to Texas, where she waited tables at an Applebee's to make ends meet before she and the kids were finally able to return to New Orleans. Perhaps worse than his complete abandonment, Zack Hatton returned one phone call to Lana after the storm, leaving her to believe, for a while, that he hadn't survived. By the time she returned to the city, her fear and anger had turned to rage, and she showed up at the Governor Nichols' apartment with a baseball bat. Zack wasn't at home, and Addie refused to answer the door. But he did finally call her and ask to meet and see the kids. Lana agreed to meet, but refused to bring the kids, rightly arguing that she wouldn't get their hopes up for a reunion, only to see them hurt again. When they did meet up, she sensed a profound hostility in Zack, who curtly informed her that Addie never wanted to see her again. Lana was outraged again that all he seemed to care about were Addie's feelings, nothing for her or his children. But they soon came to a strained yet peaceful surrender. Zack arranged to take the kids bi-weekly, but was nervous about how Addie would react to this arrangement. To his surprise, she seemed thrilled by the idea, even going shopping for new clothes for the kids. But when the first meet-up time came, she refused to meet Lana face-to-face, -face and never really interacted with the kids, instead staying out all night bar hopping when Zack had Jackson and Lily. This attitude turned into outright hostility, and she forced Zack to rent a hotel room whenever it was his weekend to have the kids. Sadly, they were old enough now to sense what was going on, and told their mother that Addie didn't like them. Friends like Jack Jones and Caps saw this as the beginning of the end. If Zack and Addie couldn't have each other to themselves, this was never going to last. But they trudged on and wound up reconnecting with a pre-Katrina friend, Greg Rogers, known as Squirrel, who was also a veteran who had fought in Afghanistan. Right after Katrina, Squirrel had been in a serious car accident, and Zack and Addie had taken care of him. Squirrel was also a drug dealer, and after he recovered, he had promised to always share what he had with the couple. Now, post-Katrina, all three were delighted to be reunited. They spent Christmas Day with Squirrel and some other holdout friends that they were determined to reconnect with. And things were looking up in other areas, too. Addie found a job bartending at the Spotted Cat, a much better gig than Hogs, and Zack soon started delivering groceries from Matassa's Market on Dauphine Street in the Lower French Quarter. While this may sound like a shit job to some of us, it's actually a storied and revered profession in the quarter, where bicycle delivery is its own culture. And Zach flourished in his new role and loved getting to know his community. He became a well-known figure in the quarter, and even Lana noticed that his self-esteem improved dramatically, noting that... Everyone knew Zach. He thought he was the king of Bourbon Street. But the service industry lifestyle, while often fraught with addiction, was particularly bad in post-Katrina when everyone was looking for an escape. Zack and Addie were no different, and in the spring of 2006 they started going on drug and drinking binges, rivaling any past issues they once had, which of course brought on Addie's dark and abusive spells, and she didn't just lash out at Zack. On one night of hard drinking with Zack and Caps, 
Addie got really wasted and started insulting them both so bad that they started really giving it back to her, so she ran off in a huff. Zack and Cap spent the night searching for Addie. When Zack eventually found her, she grabbed his phone and intercepted a text message from Caps that pissed her off. So she sent him a message back in all caps, screaming, Your entire life is a waste. With that, Caps was done and went home to get some sleep. The next morning, he told her if she ever treated him like that again, he'd walk away and she'd never see him again. Some hours later, Zack called and said he was leaving, that he was getting on a train to Oregon to see his family. Zack told Caps that after he had caught up with Addie on Decatur Street, they had returned to the Governor Nichols' apartment. Zack told Caps that after he caught up with Addie on Decatur Street, they had returned to the Governor Nichols' apartment and had an awful fight that had turned physical. They were both so drunk that they blacked out most of it, but Addie in particular couldn't even recall the details when she called Caps crying and in despair at Zack's leaving her. On the four-day train ride, Zack was completely miserable without Addie. But still, once he reached Portland, he resolved to stay and turn his life around. His brother Jed tried to talk him into returning to Iraq as a contractor, to which Zack only darkly replied that he would never return there. However, after only a few weeks, Zack made up his mind to return to New Orleans, telling his mother and the rest of his family that he had to do it for his kids. He needed to make up to them his abandonment during Katrina. And Lana was definitely pressuring him to return and take responsibility. She was sick of him running away from his problems. Addie was equally depressed and miserable without Zack, staying in the Governor Nichols' apartment and seeing only Caps who would bring by ice cream to try and cheer her up. He actually still held out hope for this volatile couple. He had lost a relationship himself after Katrina and understood the pain and the pressure. He also knew just how deeply in love Zack and Addie were, and he wanted it to work out for them so badly that he bought Zack a plane ticket home to New Orleans. Zack and Addie enjoyed a brief but blissful reunion when he returned, not leaving the apartment for three days. But it didn't take long for them to return to the cycle that they couldn't seem to break hard drinking, hard fighting, and a worsening downward spiral through the summer that even Caps couldn't handle. He was close to both of them and didn't want to be put in the middle. But after a particularly ugly incident with Addie, he did confront her and take sides, letting Zack move in with him. Addie soon turned up on his doorstep, though, demanding that Zack come back to her, and Zack just hung his head and followed her home. Caps finally understood that this relationship was too toxic to ever recover, but he resolved to try and stay out of it once and for all. So Zack and Addie continued in their ongoing drink, fight, break up and make up, and do it all over again cycle. Addie was continuously throwing Zack out of the apartment, and aside from cheap motels, he often couch surfed with friends and practically moved in with Squirrel. Squirrel recalled one night when Zack started to open up about his war experience, and Squirrel, drunk and high, scoffed at him, saying he was only an MP and hadn't seen real combat. He deeply regretted this later, wishing he had let Zack tell his story to possibly get some sort of release. And the Zack and Addie saga only continued to worsen as summer wound down to the point that even strangers were alarmed at their antics. By August, they were finally drawing attention from the police, after one fight when Addie ran off carrying a blue steel handgun that she always kept, though never loaded. She wound up brandishing it at a man in the French Quarter who called the cops. She ran home, but the cops showed up with the man who immediately ID'd her, and of course they searched the apartment, finding not only the gun, but a bag of pot and two pipes. She was arrested and charged with aggravated assault, possession of marijuana, and paraphernalia. Oddly, considering all of their other makeups, Zack refused to bail her out, even though he had the money. She eventually persuaded some friends to pull enough money together to get her out a couple of weeks later, 
and even more odd, seeing as he had refused to bail her out, Zack got right back together with her. And on and on their vicious cycle continued, when on the morning of September 28th, they got into another screaming match at the Governor Nichols' apartment, and Addie physically pushed Zack out the door. Neighbors called 911, and the cops found Zack out on the front steps. He tried to discreetly ditch a bag of pot, but the officers caught him and arrested him for possession. Addie bailed him out two days later. The non-stop drama of their relationship was finally starting to wear on Zack, who started seeking comfort elsewhere. Often working in gay bars and comfortable in the environment, Zack started hanging out in them to avoid Addie and was soon in a relationship with a local male realtor. At least, that's how he explained it when Squirrel confronted him about his sexuality, and he had confessed to being, quote, a little bi, but begged him to keep the secret from Addie. To me, this felt new. There's no other hints of any homosexual or bisexual relationships in his past. Was he finally acting on his feelings? Though Squirrel kept his secret, it didn't take long in the French Quarter for the word of Zack's new lover to spread. And aside from the fact that this only further enraged Addie, I think Zack probably felt deeply conflicted about his own sexuality, and being outed had piled onto his growing sense of shame, his self-loathing, and dread for his future. And worse for Zack, if Addie was only in dark spells before, this revelation caused outright fury and rage. She taunted him with homophobic slurs, and once stole his phone and called every woman on it telling them that he had AIDS before deleting all the numbers. Only adding to her misery were financial problems, stemming from the drinking and drug binges. After a falling out with her landlord at the Governor Nichols' apartment over plumbing, Addie was desperate to move quickly and begged Zack for help. He agreed to front the money and move in with her, hoping against all odds that their problems wouldn't follow them and that maybe a move would help. On October 2nd, three days before Addie's murder, they found a place on North Rampart Street owned by former mayoral candidate Leo Watermeyer. The tiny apartment was located above the priestess Miriam Shamani Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Because the couple had first and last month's rent in cash, and also a sad lie thrown in about their last landlord doubling the rent after Katrina, Leo handed them the keys without even drawing up a lease. But two days later, Addie showed up at his office demanding a six-month lease in her name only. Leo wrote the lease out by hand only to get Addie out of his hair until he could talk to both of them. But Zach called five minutes after she left. He told Leo he was now screwed. He had fronted all of the money and she was kicking him out. Leo went out and found the couple arguing in the stairwell with Addie screaming that she'd caught him cheating on her with another man. Leo, taken aback, quickly retreated to avoid the drama. But Zack and Addie kept fighting into the afternoon. Later, friends and family wondered what had triggered the murder. Squirrel knew about the relationship with the man Zack was in, and he knew he was furious about the money and Addie's manipulations. But Lana and his family thought it was more than that. He had promised to take Jackson and Lily that weekend, and he was trying hard to be a better father and to keep his promises, so he was seething at Addie's latest stunt. What none of them knew, though, was that Zack, who, like most veterans, was terrified of being homeless, had actually been homeless many times because of Addie. When he wasn't moving his belongings to a cheap hotel or staying at Squirrel's, he was sleeping on an old couch on the third floor of an abandoned mansion on the corner of Esplanade Avenue and Bourbon Street. So this night, finally, he wasn't going to leave. And so their fight raged on into the night of October 4th, 2006, turning physical, and sometime after midnight, according to Zach's written confession, he strangled her to death. She had stolen this apartment, tried to kick me out, and then would not shut the fuck up, so I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. Zack passed out drunk before he could start dealing with the scene of the murder. 
He woke up at 6 a.m. Thursday, October 5th, and went to Matosis for work. He ran into Caps, who noted how awful he looked. Zack explained that he and Addie had fought again and were finally finished. He said she took some of his money and packed and moved home to North Carolina. Caps immediately had a dark feeling and thought maybe Zack had killed her. But he quickly pushed the thought aside, not thinking his friend could do something like that. He also knew Addie constantly threatened to pick up and leave New Orleans. But he was wrong about his friend. Zack had completely slipped away from normal humanity, and he poured out what was happening in graphic detail in his confession. After explaining how he had killed her by strangling, he revealed just how far gone he was. He wasn't even thinking or talking about her as a person anymore when he wrote, After sexually defiling the body a few times, I was posed with the question of how to dispose of the corpse. I'm sorry we have to go here, but we can't exactly ignore it. Necrophilia is recognized as a psychiatric disorder. I'm not going too far down this rabbit hole, but I did find these statistics interesting from the American Psychiatric Association. Of the necrophiliacs in one study and their reasoning for committing the acts, 68% said it was because they wanted reunions with a dead romantic partner, and 15% were seeking self-esteem by expressing power over the victim. I can see Zach in both of these categories. But back to the timeline, after leaving work that day, he stopped to see Jack Jones at his condo and begged him to take a spur-of-the-moment trip to Asia with him. Jack said that he seemed preoccupied and stressed, that something just wasn't normal with him. Jack naturally asked about Addie, and Zach gave him the same story. But Jack didn't believe Zach's claim that she had moved home because even though she did threaten to up and leave sometimes, he knew how deep Addie's love for New Orleans was. With both Caps and Jack already questioning him about Addie, Zach knew sooner or later one of their friends would come looking. So Thursday night, he returned to the North Rampart apartment and began slowly cleaning up the crime scene, first dragging Addie's body to the bathtub, and then he detailed specifically what he did in the journal, writing, I got a saw and hacked off her feet, hands, and head, put her head in the oven after giving it an awful haircut, and put her hands and feet in the water on the range. He worked all through the night, leaving the bathroom light on, which spooked his neighbor, John Boutet, who had already had a bad feeling about the couple that had only moved in a couple of days ago. There is speculation that Zack boiled the body parts to remove the meat from the bone, but this was not confirmed by the police, though he does confess to using the oven and the letter he left behind. After working for hours, Zack eventually got drunk enough that he passed out again but he wasn't worried because as he put it in the journal, I was to be off all weekend, so I had plenty of time to work. But due to laziness, spent most of that time coked up in various bars with different girls. After waking up on Sunday afternoon, now three days after the murder, Zach realized he was supposed to have his kids that weekend. He called Lana and offered her $600 in cash that he owed in back child support if she would meet him with the kids. Lana brought Jackson and Lily to Matassa's that afternoon, where Zach told them to get all the candy and cokes they wanted, and asked Lana if it would be all right if he fixed up his place and got the kids the following weekend. She wondered if Addie would have a problem with this, as Zach was usually forced to run a motel room to get the kids, and he quickly answered no, that she wouldn't be there. Lana was surprised, but agreed to the arrangement, and the kids left excited at the prospect of spending the next weekend with their daddy. Zack then left and returned to the apartment to finish cleaning up, writing, Sunday night, I sawed off the rest of the legs and arms and put them in the roasting pans, stuck them in the oven, and passed out. I came to seven hours later with an awful smell emanating from the kitchen. I turned off the oven and went to work Monday. This will be the last day I'd work. 
John Boutte, the neighbor who had noticed the bathroom light, was having dinner outside in the courtyard that evening with a friend and noticed a strange smell. But this being New Orleans, especially after Katrina, he didn't think much of it. Monday night after work, Zach came home to Addie's rotting body parts and was finally stricken by what he had done. I scared myself, not by the action of strangling the woman I loved for one and a half years, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend the $1,500 in cash I had being happy, and then kill myself. For the next week, Zach did exactly that, drinking, snorting rails of cocaine, treating his friends to free drinks and coke, as well as lap dances. He even charmed one stripper enough that she took him home to the suburb of Metairie for two wild days of drinking drugs and sex. On that Tuesday, he ran into Squirrel, who hadn't seen him in a while, and they started partying at Rick's Cabaret on Bourbon Street. Of course, Squirrel asked about Addie, too. Squirrel didn't believe the story about Addie taking his money and leaving either, knowing she was a dedicated Puerto Rican, and told Zack that he thought it didn't make any sense. He kept on asking questions until Zack patted him on the back and told him he was going on vacation and left without another word. Then, in a drunken stupor, he realized it was October 10th, what would have been his and Lana's anniversary, so he called her. It was after midnight, and Lana was aggravated to pick up the phone to Zack shouting at her to come have a drink. She kept telling him no, reminding him that they were both in relationships with other people, even as he kept shouting at her. You're still my wife. Desperately, he offered her $400 for winter coats for the kids, and she still refused. And then he really pissed her off by whining. Come on, I want to party with my favorite stripper. Lana told him she was going back to bed and hung up on him. Zack finally came crashing back to reality and went home. The next day, Caps showed up for work at Matassa's, and their boss told him that Zack was off the radar, not answering his phone, and hadn't shown up for work in two days. Caps was concerned after the shape he'd seen Zack in a few days before and called his friend, leaving a voicemail asking Zack to just call and let him know he was okay, no questions asked. Zack called him back and said he was the only friend that cared enough to check in on him and said he would meet him in two hours to go out and party. Zack showed up already wasted and they went to the Hustler Club doing shots and getting lap dances, but Caps wasn't really into it. He had a new girlfriend and felt guilty thinking of her most of the night. They finally called it a night around 4 a.m. because Caps had to be at work in a couple of hours. Then on Saturday, Caps was hosting a housewarming party and his bartender didn't show, so he gave Zack a call and Zack showed up, bartending and partying into the early dawn hours on Sunday. Caps had to be at work the next morning and he didn't see Zack again. Zack Bowen then spent the next few days preparing to leave this world, putting 28 cigarette burns all over his body, one for each year of his life, drinking, drugging, and filling the pages of Addie's diary with his confession letter. He wrote of his final days. Good food, good drugs, and good strippers. I had a fantastic time living out my days. Fuck it all, and fucking no regrets. That last line is a quote from a Metallica song called Saint Anger. He had this same line tattooed on his stomach just above his pubic area. Zack also wrote out a final list of what seemed to be his life's failures. It read in this order. Friends, jobs, military, marriage, love. And he ended the note with... It's just about time now. The only numbers left are friends and family members. So get to work. And as Detective Morovich later saw when he came to the crime scene, Zack had spray-painted Lana's number over the bathtub with the words, Call my wife. Finally, on Tuesday, October 17th, 12 days after Addie's murder, 
he showed up at Squirrel's apartment trying to get his friend to go and party with him. But Squirrel was hungover already and refused to get up. So Zack grabbed a $20 bag of Coke and walked out of the door without a word. He walked straight to the Omni Royal at 621 St. Louis Street and after spending the afternoon drinking by the pool, jumped off the roof. Detective Morovich and the rest of the NOPD crime scene squad were surprised when they searched the apartment and there wasn't any blood anywhere and very little smell. The AC set on 60 helped explain the lack of smell and after finding Zack's confession, they understood the lack of blood. He hadn't dismembered Addie until over a day after strangling her, so there wouldn't have been much blood, if any, and he did it in the bathtub. They also noted other writing covering the walls of the small apartment in black spray paint. Zack had put in all caps, I'm a total failure, and in reference to Addie, he wrote, I love her, with the silver arrow pointing to her rotting body parts in the stove. And in the largest of all messages, on the wall read, Please help me stop the pain. The detective called Lana and broke the news, and word of the gruesome murder spread like lightning. New Orleans Chief of Detectives Anthony Canatella released a statement to reporters the next day about the murder-suicide, saying that Zach must have had some serious mental anguish before assuring the reporters that though Zach did kill, dismember, and store Addie's body in the kitchen, he didn't eat her. There was no sign of cannibalism at the scene or in Zach's letter. Though, of course, the media was already reporting that anyway. Lana's friends kept calling her and begging her not to watch the news, and she took their advice as she was in enough shock as it was. But now the local media was running with the grisly story. It was being picked up by national outlets, and Lena had to pull herself together enough to call and break the news to Zach's mother, Lori, who then had to tell the rest of Zach's family. The immediate aftermath for Lana was horrific. She was dealing with reporters, and as she was still Zach's legal wife, she had to get his belongings from the crime scene and help his family with the arrangements. Jed was still reeling from his own recent return from Iraq, and with the rest of the family in turmoil and reporters constantly harassing everyone, they decided it best to not have a service and simply have Zach cremated with Lana keeping his ashes in New Orleans. I cannot imagine the pain and suffering Lana went through during this period as she put her children on a plane to be with Zach's family and tried to deal with this alone. She had no family of her own left, and she was in deep shock and grief. She headed out for a solitary road trip, but was picked up for a DUI in Texas. Luckily, she was let off with probation, and was able to get her kids and return to New Orleans, where she constantly raged at Zach, both for ending Addie's life and for spending his own last days so selfishly. She was tempted to flush his ashes down the toilet, but she never did. She was also feeling terrible guilt because only a couple of weeks before the murder, she had taken Zach to dinner and asked him to finalize their divorce. And she also felt tremendous guilt over what her kids were going through. According to Lana, some asinine psychiatrist in New Orleans, whom she won't name, told her that she needed to tell the kids the whole truth about what happened. And you can just imagine what that did to their young psyches. They couldn't sleep, and when they did, they were besieged with nightmares, and Lily developed a constant stomach ache. When Lana took her to see a specialist, even that jerk pulled her aside and asked, Did he eat her? In Lana's own words, she said, He ruined my fucking life, and he ruined his children's lives. They will never be whole. But at the same time, she was glad he had taken his own life, because she couldn't imagine how she and the kids would have lived through a probably very public trial, figuring she would have had to leave the country. And, after her rage subsided, she was glad for Zach's sake, because she knew him and knew his conscience wouldn't be able to take Addie's murder. So instead, he dealt himself the ultimate punishment, on his own terms. Zack didn't just want to die on his own terms. 
He had also lived his life that way, or tried to. I think there is a profound duality to Zachary Bowen's nature. On the one hand, he was a free spirit, a fun-loving, spontaneous, and adventurous, charming little devil. On the other, he was a deeply loyal man with an almost crippling sense of responsibility to those he loved, up to and including his own country, or at least his brothers in arms. These sides to Zach didn't exactly flow together, more like they banged against each other and made him miserable. He was probably also deeply conflicted and possibly ashamed about his bisexuality, not only because of his life as a straight husband, boyfriend, and father, but also as a soldier. You factor in his drug and alcohol abuse, the post-traumatic stress disorder from both the wars he fought in and Katrina, Addie's constant abuse, and his fear of homelessness, and well, you can see this young man igniting with the trigger Addie pulled on October 4, 2006, when she literally stole his home as she broke his heart. From what I gather looking into intimate partner violence when it comes to female abusers, they are usually women who have been in abusive relationships or were raised in a household with one. It's a difficult field to study because so few men come forward about the abuse, feeling their sense of masculinity would be threatened, and I can definitely see this being part of the pattern in the Zack and Addie relationship. Also, we are still learning so much about post-traumatic stress disorder in our veterans, and we still aren't doing enough to address the problem. At the time of the Zack and Addie tragedy, the Army estimated one-third of returning veterans suffered from PTSD. Aside from their alarming suicide rate, the homicide rate for veterans wasn't even being tracked by the Army. In a New York Times piece in January of 2008, Two reporters had found 120 cases of homicides by vets returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Zach's handsome face was one of the feature pictures on the article which told of his case along with 23 other veterans. Additionally, Zach's service in the Army may give some insight into the psychology of his gruesome dismemberment of Addie. He was exposed to mass graves saw colleagues with limbs blown off, and was horrified by the sight of many dead children. Lana once found a folder with pictures of dead Iraqi on Zach's laptop, and while she furiously made him get rid of the photos, she was shocked at his casual attitude towards the graphic nature of them. Some of his army buddies also described the wars he was involved in as all-encompassing. You walked, ate, and slept knowing that you could be blown to bits at any time. You worked so hard to help the civilians and either saw them murdered before your own eyes, or worse, knew that they had betrayed you to the enemy. After a while, there is a certain disassociation that occurs. Your mind just goes somewhere else. I think Zack, after strangling Addie in a fit of rage, did disassociate. His rambling confession letter immediately struck me as oddly dispassionate, as he referred coldly to her body as the corpse, and wrote of sawing off the arms, not her arms. And of course, we know he put her in the oven and turned it on. She was no longer a person to him. He was doing a job, trying to dispose of the body the only way he knew how. It was only later after almost two weeks of numbing himself with coke and booze, that he woke up to the horror of what he had done. And he knew he had to pay the price, the ultimate price. For him, it was his life for hers. I owe a huge thank you to author Ethan Brown, who wrote Shake the Devil Off. Not only was he able to gain the trust of Zack's army buddies, he moved to New Orleans and immersed himself in the post-Katrina culture. His respectful reporting showed that Zach was just as much a victim as Addie, and I cannot recommend this book enough. One last pitiful detail to the story I'd like to share is that Addie Hall's family took six months to claim her remains and give her a proper burial. She had led a sad life, 
suffering childhood sexual abuse, and then left home as soon as she could. I imagine her demons were as deep as Zach's. Her drug addiction, rage, and disconnect from family certainly point to this. But I also see that she had that effervescent spark that Zach possessed. People adored Addie. Even ex-boyfriends would remain friends with her. She was also spontaneous, fun-loving and unusual, artistic and beautiful. Ironically, as I was researching and writing this script, I already had titled the episode The Ballad of Zack and Addie. Of course, then I stumbled across a song called The Ballad of Addie and Zack by Gal Holiday in the Honky Tonk Review. It's on iTunes, YouTube, and you can also download it from their website. Seems like I'm not the only one who considered the pair to be star-crossed lovers, too different and yet too alike, on a collision course that ended both of their lives, with Katrina ironically providing a brief respite. And so that does it for the tale of Zack and Addie, at least for now. I honestly can't believe no one has made a movie yet about their story, though there is a documentary that's on lockdown for now. One of Addie's friends, Margaret Sanchez, that was interviewed for the documentary, actually murdered and beheaded someone herself. So for now, the prosecution has managed to get it shut down. It's called Zack and Addie and has a website and a Facebook page you can follow but you can be sure I'll also let y'all know if I hear of anything new. This case is so fascinating, and it haunted me for weeks. Not just because of the gruesome details, but because it is such a tragic and heartbreaking story of a young couple, damaged and destructive, but so very much in love. And I'll leave you with some of the lyrics to Gal Holiday's beautiful song. He did commit a black indeed. The devil's feast was lain, and though we wished it all a dream, he knew that he must pay. I'll not detail for gentle ears, more for it was grim, but when the sunlight showed its face, he'd torn her limb from limb. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. The voice actors for both of the Zack and Addie episodes were Brandon Hawkins as Zach Bowen and Jamie Stevens as Lana Shupak. If you like the show, please tell a friend or write and review on iTunes. I'm also on Google Play and Stitcher and many other podcast platforms. If you have any comments, corrections, or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime if you'd like to connect with me there. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.